Hi there. In this episode, I want to continue a conversation I had uh, in the a last video I made called The Quran Claims the Jews Say Ezra is the Son of God, but what Jew ever believed that? That was on the 10th of December. And in that uh, video, I discussed um, the contents of a lecture given by Tim Winter at Cambridge University on this subject, and he uh, particularly referenced this work uh, called A History of the Jews of Arabia from Ancient Times to Their Eclipse Under Islam by a scholar, Gordon Newby, who's a, an academic in the US, at a professor at a US uh, university. So I immediately ordered on, on uh, Amazon wanting to read this book for myself. And so I just wanted to, what I'm gonna do is actually just quote from it, the relevant passage um, that references the Quran's claim in verse uh, chapter 9, verse 30, which I'll read. <coughs> the Jews say Ezra, or Uzziah, is God's son, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of God. These are merely verbal assertions in imitation of the sayings of those unbelievers who preceded them. May Allah ruin them. How do they turn away from the truth? And this has often perplexed, uh, well, Muslims and uh, non-Muslim scholars. What is uh, going on here? And uh, I refer you to the discussion, uh, which I still very much uh, stand by, uh, that Tim Winter offered in uh, that I surveyed in that video. But now I want to just read uh, from the book that he referenced. Now this is very dry. This is this is a hardcore academic book. It doesn't take any prisoners. It's not written for the layman. But it does contain, uh, in in the inimitable style of an academic work, uh, the the uh, the essential um, historical references and the survey of the evidence from uh, the Arab the Arab Jews at that time and what they believed and what the Quran is almost certainly referring to. Um, just a few points of vocabulary first, because otherwise you might be completely lost, as I would have been if I had not known this. Um, he talks about Karaite Jews. Um, Karaite Jews are, this is very simplified. Karaite Jews are those who are those Jews, self-identified Jews, been around for thousands of years, at least since the time of Jesus, when they were known as Sadducees. These people did not believe in the oral law. All they believed in was the written law. Uh, that's the first five books of Moses, from Genesis through to uh, Deuteronomy, Numbers. Uh, Exodus and Leviticus and uh, they rejected the oral law and and the whole apparatus that developed after that with the uh, the, the Mishnah and the Midrash and the the Talmud and the sages commentaries and, and so on and so forth um, so th they were uh, a small group they're very very small today they're much bigger in centuries past and they um, attacked what's called Rabbinite Judaism or rabbinic Judaism, and this is what we're all familiar with, rabbinic Judaism, otherwise otherwise known as orthodox Judaism, uh, and that's all there was mainly, uh, orthodox Judaism, until relatively recently when we had things like reform Judaism, liberal Judaism, reconstructionist Judaism, and all these kind of spin-offs that basically accommodate themselves to modernity and Western liberal values, uh, and one of those groups is actually atheist as well. Anyway, Rabbinic Judaism does believe in the oral law. So God gave Moses the written law and the oral law. So there's two Torahs, uh, and this was written down, the oral law, and it's called the Mishnah. And later rabbinic uh, rabbis' commentary on this was also incorporated in a big volume, a big text called the Talmud. And that is a focus of study and spiritual sustenance and, and life for Jews today, not what Christians call the Old Testament. Now, I mention all this because um, this is relevant to the discussion here, um, because uh, the Karaite uh, Jews uh, attacked the rabbinic, what we call the, the, the rabbinical Jews for um, their uh, idolatry, for their worshipping other than God. Uh, and this is obviously to do with the passage in the Quran, Quran 9.30, this mysterious verse. So I'll just read it. I will make one or two comments just to perhaps clarify things but i say this is a hardcore academic work it's not meant for the layman apologies if it's impenetrable but i just wanted to get this on record because it's such a uh important piece of research uh if we want to know what western or some western scholars there's not just him there's, there's a whole school of thought uh, associated with this view 
um, that basically gives a very, I think, a very credible explanation as to the historical uh, referent of um, Quran 930. And it wasn't just a, a big mistake by Muhammad or something. This is a serious piece of um, theological critique, taking the Karaite side, if you like, in a debate within Judaism over against the rabbinic Jews who were worshipping um, uh, a lesser Yahweh, as it was called. Anyway, I'm jumping ahead. So I'll just read this and um, good luck if you can <laughs> stay up with it. So um, so he quotes a scholar, uh, Stephen Westerstrom, who is another academic. Stephen Westerstrom, and I start on page 59 of this book, by the way. Stephen Westerstrom has demonstrated that post-Islamic Karaite attacks on rabbinic Judaism depict the rabbinites, I rabbinic Jews, both as anthropomorphizing and as worshipping an angel that functions as the substitute creator of a universe. So here we have these uh, Karaite Jews I mentioned criticizing the rabbinic Jews, who are perhaps the mainstream, uh, if you like, for worshipping an angel uh, that functions as a substitute creator of the universe, as a quasi creator. That angel is usually identified with the Metatron, this word again, this wonderful word which obviously has become famous through Hollywood. Um, now, Enoch was frequently equated with Metatron and regarded as a lesser lord or a lesser Yahweh, an angel creator. That is not making angels, but a creator who was an angel. When we look into later authors who write about varieties of Jews, we find both anthropomorphizing and the belief in the creator angel to be an essential definition of rabbinite Judaism in the early Islamic period. So this belief in this creator angel, this lesser Yahweh, is an essential part of rabbinic Judaism in the early Islamic, so presumably that would be the 7th and 8th century. Um, the Karaite hesiograph, al uh, a, he a hesiograph would be um, someone who writes about heresies, for example, uh, defends Jews generally against the charges of anthropomorphism, but as a Karaite, he does criticise uh, the rabbinic Jews for that very practice. Uh, there is no evidence for the existence of an anti-rabbinite precursive Karaite group in Arabia upon which Muhammad was drawing. So he's saying that in, a, in the Arabia itself, uh, there was no evidence for an anti-Karaite, sorry, an anti-rabbinic um, group or precursor, or prototype group in um, Arabia at Muhammad's time. Rather, we ought to be able to look at the taxonomic categories of later polemicists against, in this case, the Rabbinites to find delineations of some of their beliefs. I did warn you, didn't I, about the text? The Quran, of course, is not objecting to anthropomorphism, as, the, as the, the later part of 564 shows. Now, this refers to several paragraphs before what I'm quoting, where he discusses that verse, and you can look it up, 564. I'm not going to go into that now, um, because that's a passage that mentions God's hands as open to bounty. It is clear, nevertheless, that the, that the polemic against the Jews in this passage in the Quran is against rabbinic Jews, who have by way of interest to offer us a passing acquaintance with magic and mysticism and are well acquainted with the Enoch traditions. So, OK, um, Enoch, by the way, uh, as, as you might know, is a biblical character right back at the beginning of Genesis. He was there at the time of the flood. Uh, this is Noah's flood. And the, 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 the Jewish uh, story is that God raised him up to heaven, translated him straight to heaven, stripped him of his humanity and made him into a, a kind of a lesser Yahweh, a kind of angel creator, where he uh, was given extraordinary knowledge and insight into the whole universe, basically, you know, a quasi-divine figure. Um, and then uh, Newby continues in the next paragraph. Another example of a belief that we can attribute to the, uh, the rabbinical Jews is found in Quran 9, 30, 31. This is our verse. And then he quotes... Um, and the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. That is a saying of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved of old, etc. Um, and then he says, Ezra is noted in the Bible 
as the leader of the expedition of return to Jerusalem from exile. So when uh, the Jews came back from um, Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple uh, and reestablish the Jewish state. For, rab for the rabbis, Ezra was the equivalent of Moses. Sanhedrin 21b contends, sorry, he doesn't tell you what this stuff is. Sanhedrin 21b is a part of the Talmud. There's actually a, uh, a whole um, order, it's called. Um, uh, and within that tractate chapters, um, that's chapter, that, that part of that is called Sanhedrin 21. It's actually a very interesting chapter if you read it. This contends that Ezra would have been the recipient of the Torah had it not already been given to Moses. But he was instead given the task of restoring the forgotten law. He is credited with the introduction of the proper means of writing the Torah, and for this activity he was given the title of Scribe, with a capital S. In extra-rabbinic literature, this appellation is given as Scribe of the Knowledge of the Most High, a title usually given to one of the seven archangels, um, Elijah and Enoch. Ezra was a disciple of Baruch, or Baruch, as in Barack Obama, I think, uh, who was taken by God to heaven while alive, and Ezra himself was translated to heaven alive, which represents another point of correspondence with Elijah and Enoch. As I was saying, Enoch also was taken straight to heaven. The equation of Ezra and the scribe, sorry, the equation, the equation of Ezra the scribe with Enoch the scribe and their translations is most likely the solution to our problem. So then he goes on. Ezra was, the, was of a generation of the flood, as I said, um, of those who transgressed. Uh, in the popular books of Enoch, so we have Enoch, uh, first Enoch, second Enoch, three Enoch. These are so-called apocryphal Jewish texts, which are also quite uh, they were popular with Christians as well. Enoch is taken up to heaven so that he would not be destroyed when God abandoned the earth and as a sign of God's mercy that a pious man would be saved. When translated into heaven, that means when he was taken up, assumed into heaven, he was stripped of his humanity and transformed into the powerful angel Metatron, who was taught by God all the secrets, more than any other creature indeed, and was given guardianship over the treasures of God and became a lesser God or another way of putting it, a lesser Yahweh. So there's two Yahwehs. So this is obviously polytheism. Um, then it quotes from uh, three Enoch, and I'm not going to read this out. It's actually very interesting, but it backs up what he's saying. There's actual quotes from the text. And lastly, in the last paragraph, you'll be glad to hear, um, he says, it is particularly interesting to find this material in three Enoch, he's just quoted, because we can deduce that the inhabitants of the Hid the Hijaz, that's an area of northwest West Arabia, uh, in modern Saudi Arabia, the inhabitants of the Hijaz during Muhammad's time knew portions at least of three Enoch in association with the Jews. The angels over which Metatron became chief were identified in the Enoch traditions as the sons of God, in other words, the Beni Elohim in Hebrew, the watchers, the fallen ones, as the causes of the flood. Uh, in one Enoch and four Ezra, the term son of God can be applied to the Messiah, but most often it is applied to righteous men of whom Jewish tradition holds there to be no more righteous than the ones God elected to translate to heaven alive, Enoch and so on. It is easy then to imagine that among the Jews of the, Hid of the Hijaz, who were apparently involved in the mystical speculations associated uh, with Ezra, because of this trans tradition of his translation and out of piety, he became equated with Enoch as the scribe of God and could be termed one of the Bene Elohim. And of course, he would fit the description of a religious leader um, uh, whom the Jews had exalted. So that is that. I mean, it, it is quite quite a densely packed, um, and I'm running out of time here, quite a densely packed text. But there is a there is solid historical evidence and research to uh, to give quite quite a full account of what's going on when the Quran's claim in 930, and that really does have some very real substance in uh, mainstream Jewish rabbinic Judaism. Um, a, a, as a, a almost an idolatry or worshipping a, a son of God in a very divine way, which the Quran is criticising very strongly in the way that it does 
Christians for Jesus being the Son of God.